that leads me, ladies and gentlemen, to my concluding video. A year or so ago, I made a program just before the election which saw me sent to Brussels on behalf of my constituents called Better Off Out. It is a blatant piece of British patriotism and I'd like you to enjoy it for the next few minutes. Thank you very much. I'm no more a European than I'm an Eskimo. I'm English, I'm British, and I'm proud of it. And I'm proud of my country. This is Runnymede, where 800 years ago, the monarch recognized the rights and freedoms of the British people and their rights to govern themselves. <laughs> No one in Britain has ever voted on whether they want to be governed by the European Union. Today, opinion polls regularly confirm the answer is no, especially when people realise we could carry on trading freely with Europe after we left. For the majority of British people, the time has come to change the course of history, because the evidence is building up that Britain would be better off out. More and more people now think we'd be better off as the free, proud, independent, sovereign country we've been for hundreds of years. Better off with the freedoms, rights, customs and way of life we've enjoyed for generations and which have stood the test of time. Better off regularly electing a fully accountable parliament to look after our interests and throwing out the rascals if we dislike their decisions. Better off re-establishing the rule of law with our own Parliament scrutinising, approving, amending or repealing British law as it sees fit. Better off abolishing government by foreign diktat. Better off trading freely with the rest of the world, unencumbered by thousands of pointless and costly regulations. Better off spending British taxpayers' money for the benefit of the British people. Better off with full control over our economy, our cash, our assets, our way of doing things. Better off making our own decisions in our own best interests. Better off being what we are, an island off the continent of Europe with a global view of the world. Much better all that than being told how much influence we have in the EU, whilst finding out all the time how little we really have. Being told the EU can be reformed from within when all the evidence over 30 years says differently and being told how isolated we'd be when in reality we find ourselves embarrassingly isolated as a minority of one amongst 25. In truth, we are, and always have been, a British square peg in a European round hole. The world listens when Britain speaks. We contribute significantly on the international stage and always have done. Our distinctive voice is welcomed in the UN G8 meetings, in NATO, wherever there are big issues to resolve. We are a force for good, 
a stabilizing and civilizing influence, strong and compassionate as circumstances demand. Britain is outward looking, for its size, the world's biggest global trader, a maritime nation, the home of modern parliamentary democracy, where true sovereignty is vested in the people. As a fair-minded, basically honest people, we demand certain minimum standards from our public figures, from our government, and from our civil servants. We demand a proper account of how they spend taxpayers' money, our money, unlike the EU's road to nowhere in North Wales. This road was built with European Union money many years ago for local industries. What have we got? A locked barrier, no industries. In Britain, we don't tolerate such things, nor do we tolerate villains in government. We don't allow bureaucrats to invent laws behind closed doors and without full parliamentary scrutiny. We don't acquiesce at widespread corruption and the misuse of public money. We reject the EU's dictatorial, wasteful and deceitful instincts. We don't expect to be told that 60% of our trade is with the EU, implying that membership is crucial to our economic well-being, when even the minister saying it knows it's a barefaced lie. The facts are quite different. Trade is not the same as exports. Almost 80% of our total trade is within the UK. So to talk about 60% of our trade being with the EU is sheer nonsense. Not even 60% of our international trade is with the EU, unless we pretend that the huge volumes of exports and imports going through the container ports of Rotterdam and Antwerp to and from other parts of the world are somehow magically converted into trade with the EU. Britain is Europe's biggest customer. They need us far more than we need them. We buy a fifth of everything they export. Would BMW stop selling us cars if we were a self-governing nation again? Could it afford to? Would the French refuse to sell us champagne or the Danes their bacon? Will the hoteliers of Spain refuse to accept bookings from British holidaymakers? Of course not. Even EU Commissioner Neil Kinnock admitted as much on the BBC's Today programme in reply to a question from Nigel Farage of the UK Independence Party. He said, if the UK leaves the EU, there will be no trade recriminations. So the threat to three million British jobs is a lie as well. Mr Kinnock said so. Yet the cost to British businesses, 91% of which have no dealings with the EU, far exceeds the benefits as they attempt to comply with some 30,000 regulations from Brussels and face another 3,000 every year, often with catastrophic consequences for people and small businesses. Many hundreds of these rules are concerned only with the nanny state and political correctness, and every single one of them we managed perfectly well without before we joined the EU. Not only has no British Parliament ever scrutinised this mountain of red tape, but the EU's own Parliament hasn't either. It has no power to do so. It's a sham, a democratic fig leaf, there to provide an illusion of accountable government. Instead, the British Civil Service dutifully gold plates all these regulations, whilst Europeans just ignore those they dislike. Just imagine the explosion of enterprise and initiative amongst our legion of small businesses that would follow the monumental bonfire of regulations imposed so far. Surely these businesses, their employees and their customers would all be much better off out. Less interference, more reason to take commercial risks, lower costs, more jobs, better value for money, everyone wins. Which brings us to one of the great mysteries. Why would the British want to tie themselves to an economic bloc that is in steep long-term decline, even by its own admission? The French Institute of International Relations said in a report commissioned by the EU itself and published in May 2003 that the EU's share of world trade will halve over the next 50 years. It went on, the EU will have an ever-decreasing influence its chapter in history will draw to a slow but inexorable close. Britain can only be much better off out of such a debilitating nightmare. Even Mexico now has a free trade agreement with the EU, while Switzerland is literally surrounded by the EU and has no problem trading with its neighbours. 
and Norway, of course, had the good sense to retain its independence from the beginning. My name is Nini Mikkelsen. I am Norwegian. And Norway is very much like Scotland, but also different. Now, why is it different? It is because we are independent and we are also rich. The health service functions. Nobody waits long for treatment. The farming thrives and the waters are teeming with fish. Norwegian oil is not threatened to be used as a common EU resource. Why the difference is? We voted to stay out of the common market. Unfortunately, we voted to stay in the European Union. For generations, our communities have fished these waters, but there's now no future for our families, like my own. It's generally accepted that British registered boats are only allowed about 12% of the value of the fish in our own waters. Whether we are crofters, tenant farmers, owner-occupier farmers, or landowners, we are all suffering at the hands of the European Union bureaucrats. The European Union is destroying British agriculture. The British people owe it to these men and many thousands more like them to restore dignity and the right to earn a living to those who work our precious land and risk their lives at sea. As a self-governing nation once again, Britain can bring 14 million acres of prime land back into production. Our farmers will be free again to use the best grasslands in Western Europe to grow the best beef and lamb as they see fit to use the best soils to grow what they want, how they want, where they want, and without interference. We shall recover our territorial waters and restore to our fishermen the right to fish and conserve stocks as they see fit. My name is Yola Kay. I have lived in England for nearly 40 years now, and I come originally from Poland and I go regularly to visit my friends and family but I know that Poland has nearly 50 million people and a lot of them are young and a lot of them would like to improve their lifestyle, they would like to travel, they would like to do what people in the West can do if they can earn better money. A lot of people are getting ready to come and work in the West, meaning England. We shall recover control of our borders and stop the present human tidal wave of immigration. We shall recover full control over our foreign affairs, our security and defence. Once again the oath of loyalty sworn by the armed forces, by the judiciary and by the police to the monarch will carry real meaning. Even the oaths of office sworn by Her Majesty's own ministers might once again be observed, both in the spirit and to the letter. We can restore the use of imperial measurements so that Mrs. Jones can have her pound of bananas when she wants them. Lovely bananas, three pounds for one twenty. Only pounds an ounce is sold here and coin of the realm. We can fully restore our age-old rights of protection against the oppression of the state, the presumption of innocence, habeas corpus and trial by jury we can abolish the European arrest warrant and the politically correct Human Rights Act, which in any case is based on a fallacy. Our rights and freedoms as free-born Britons are not in the gift or at the mere discretion of a government we elected in the first place. They answer to us, not the other way round. We can restore the proper education of our children so that they once again understand the importance of Magna Carta, the Declaration of Rights, and the supreme significance of the centuries-old fact that we are sovereign in our own land. We will be free to preserve our gold and currency reserves, the pound, our North Sea oil, our status and independence on the world stage, our place as the fourth largest economy in the world, a low taxation, lightly regulated, enterprise-driven, open and fair society. We shall put out of reach of the EU's grasping tentacles our own pension funds, one of the biggest assets owned by the people of Britain. Family homes, bought by mortgage over decades, will not be threatened by changes in interest rates and inheritance tax from a European mindset that thinks such issues are unimportant. Gone will be the risk of VAT on children's clothes, food and sources of knowledge. 
gone will be the current and future threats to our airspace, to our boat builders, cheesemakers and hauliers, to our hallmarks, hedgerows, ponies, oak trees, paper rounds and herbal medicines, to our postal services, slaughterhouses, art market, taxis, waste disposal, whiskey, the London bus, chocolate, small businesses of every kind, the working week and the roast beef of old England. All these and many more will be back under our control. We can abolish the EU's expensive, undemocratic, unelected and completely useless regional assemblies which hold out their begging bowls for some of our money back and thus let in Brussels to control our local British affairs. We can swiftly end that humiliation and return to British democracy. We will be free once again to take our proper place in the Anglo-Saxon and English-speaking world, play our full part in the overdue revival of the British Commonwealth and trade freely with our kith and kin around the globe. And there'll be nothing to stop us dealing with genuinely international problems like pollution by negotiation and agreements between nations, just as we've always done. And now, the money. We will decide our own interest rates, retain our own exchange rate, which can properly reflect our petro-currency status, and remove the risk of crippling exchange controls being reimposed by Brussels. We can allow our economic cycle to mirror our performance as a nation, recognize the unique financial strengths of the City of London and our many world-class enterprises, the importance of our small business sector and our international trading traditions. Even on the most conservative estimate, we shall save over £20 billion every year of our own money. And we shall decide how it is best spent on our own needs. That's a cash saving of £1.4 million an hour, some £300,000 a week in every constituency. And what will it buy? More new hospitals, doctors and nurses than we could ever need. Or more new comprehensive schools and teachers than we could ever need. Or more police than we could ever need. Or a substantial increase in the state pension. Or abolish fuel tax, or slash council tax, lower income tax and halve the lowest rate. Or more realistically, a sensible combination of these choices made by a government acting in our best interests. And consider who benefits. Our pensioners, small businesses, the sick, the young, our farmers and fishermen, the weak and vulnerable, the dynamic and enterprising, our families, us all. Compare all that with a country offered a mere bauble in return, a tiny saving when we change holiday money abroad. We can rid ourselves of so much other nonsense too, like a fisheries commissioner from landlocked Austria telling us what we can catch off our own coasts. A Spaniard trying to bring our roads up to standard. A Greek telling us how to look after the weak and vulnerable. And a culture commissioner from Luxembourg telling us about lifestyle. Once again, we can make our own decisions on public investment, on our roads and rail networks. <laughs> on where and how we incentivize new industries and employment. No longer will such decisions be hampered by interference from Brussels. So where does all this leave us now? According to the International Trade Commission, there are no economic benefits from Britain's membership of the EU, whilst there are enormous costs and corruption is out of control. What's more, no federal structure enforced on disparate peoples has ever succeeded in the long run. So history says the collapse of the EU is inevitable the only question is, when? We have seen the danger of suppressed dissent in the Middle East, in the USSR, in Yugoslavia and Northern Ireland. And we have seen the power of a people
however small their country, when they're determined not to tolerate the imposition of a foreign government. Václav Havel led Czechoslovakia to freedom against daunting odds and fear of Soviet military might. Tiny Iceland and Gibraltar stand tall and free, largely by willpower. There's no doubt the fourth largest economy in the world can do so too. Europeans cannot be our masters. They're our neighbours. They should be our friends. And they can be again, once we've left their devious system of government by bureaucratic regulation. At home, our elected politicians will once again be fully accountable and our civil servants back under proper control. Our constitution, based on just a few documents and tested over many centuries, often at great sacrifice and cost, will be restored in full. When Napoleon was rampaging all over Europe 200 years ago, William Pitt the Younger said, we must remember what we have at stake, our property, our liberty, our independence, our existence as a nation, everything dear and valuable this side of the grave. These words are true again today, but this time our generation must stand and fight.